I thought, you know, everybody uses that phrase, and we've talked about what it means to be forgiven, but I, I, about being between a rock and a hard place, but I took some time, and I looked it up. Yes, I know, I'm one of those weird people. I had to look up where it came from, all right? Everybody kind of knows what the definition is, um, and, and it's a very American colloquialism, actually. Um, um, there's some other phrases that can mean kind of the same thing, a catch-22, uh, between the devil and a deep blue sea. But the actual citation comes from um, Arizona in the early 1900s. And it meant to be between a rock and a hard place, to be bankrupt, which is common in Arizona in recent panics, sporadic in California. The recent panics referred to in that citation are undoubtedly the events surrounding the so-called US, U.S. Bankers Panic of 1907. The financial crisis was especially damaging to the mining and railroad industries of the western states. In 1917, the lack of funding precipitated by the earlier banking crisis led to a dispute between copper mining companies and mine workers in Brisbee, Arizona. The workers, some of whom had organized in the labor unions, approached the company management with a list of demands for better pay and conditions. They were refused and subsequently many workers in the Bisbee mines were forcibly deported to New Mexico. It's tempting, then, to, given that the mine workers were faced with the choice between harsh and underpaid work at the work rock, rock face on the one hand and unemployment and poverty on the other. And that, this, is the source of the phrase. The phrase began to be used frequently in U.S. newspapers in the late 1930s, often with the alternative warning between a rock and a hard place. You know, when somebody actually says they're between a rock and a hard place, what they really are saying is they're between two equally difficult and unacceptable choices. The term was first used back in the 1900s, and we talked about that, and gave the impression of being crushed or caught between two rocks. They're stressing that there was two opposing forces restricting your movement, and based on that, the person is unable to, for some particular reason, to do what they should like to do, such as act or not act in a certain way. When someone makes the statement, they're looking at the both, the rock and the hard place, as having a negative outcome based on their final choice. In part one of the, in part one of this series, and there's there's several parts of this, I want you to know up front that being between the rock and the hard place is not the real problem. I'm going to stress this point throughout the series, but the key concept that I want you to gain from this is knowing and understanding who our Heavenly Father is and believing and acting on what He has said without compromise or apology. This, in and of itself, represents a rock and a hard place for many Christians. You see, we have all failed so many more times compared to the number of victories we have experienced. Some of us have allowed our personal failures and the failures of those around us to define our theology. When we choose to, what we choose to believe about God and His standards is based more on what our experience is than what His Word says. And our standards are not solely based on the word, but what has happened to us and those around us. If I am a good person and that does not override my sin, that is normal by the world's standard. And as everyone else is doing them, there are times when we will all place ourselves between a rock and a hard place because our theology becomes defined by our failures. I can continue to do this, and there's nothing wrong with doing this because everybody else is doing it. And that's what I want to address here. I want you to take a hard look at yourself, and I'm going to do the same thing in mine, and we take a hard look individually and as a church, because you need to understand that our theology needs to be based on who he is and not what our experiences are. Experience can be very deception, deceptive. It can lead us down paths and we think, oh, my experience tells me one thing. But it doesn't necessarily, because experiences can be counterfeited. You can think, oh, this is what God is showing me to do, but you can be tricked and you can be deceived if you rely completely on your own personal experience for your understanding of who God is. You can be deceived that way, because you might misinterpret, you might misunderstand. So everything needs to be judged in light of his scripture. Now, with all that said and done, tonight we're going to focus on one particular aspect of God, one particular rock in the hard place that I think we struggle with. And I want you to know that we're forgiven and that our understanding of this impacts our ability to walk in faith with God. You see, what God says about forgiveness is very different from what we think about is forgiveness. We need to know and understand who our Father is and believe and act on what He has said without compromise or apology. 
The first thing we need to believe and act on is the fact that we have been forgiven. This is important to every Christian because we have a tendency to live in the past where our sins are concerned. We run around and say, oh, you know, I did such and such, and I did so and so, and I did this, and I did that, and I beat myself up. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay a concept at your feet here that I want you to get hold of because here's what I want you to understand. If you say, if you go to God and you say, Father, you confess your sins, you admit you're a sinner, you admit what you've done wrong, you turn from them, which we call, which the, the, the biblical word is the repent, which all it means is, is an old military term that means about face, but you turn from your sin, you go the other direction, and you've gone to him and you've confessed, you've admitted you're a sinner, you've admitted what you did wrong, you've admitted how you violated his law, and you repented of it, then you're for, and he's forgiven you of it? Folks, it's gone. You're clean. So you can't come back five minutes later and say, well, you know, God, I know I asked you forgiveness, and you said you forgave me, and I know you forgave me, but I can't forgive myself. Uh, excuse me? You can't forgive yourself? What happened there? We need to get it in our head that when God says he forgave us, we're clean. And it is the utmost in pride, yes, pride, you heard me right, to run around and say, well, you know, even though God said I forgave, he forgave me, I can't forgive myself. I gotta hold myself accountable. I gotta make myself penance. I gotta beat myself up and show myself just how bad I really was, even though I've already gone to God and God's already forgiven me of my sin. Okay. We remember them, we think about them, and we make plans to try to move beyond them. And even though we have repented and recognized that God has forgiven us, we're still trapped in the shadow of our sins and wonder if God is also remembering them. You know, we get this picture in our head that God is sitting up in heaven with a big note card saying, okay, there's three more for Michael and two more for Cassie and six more for Random and five more for Morgan. And he's going down the list, chalking marks. And he's waiting for, well, you know, when they get to heaven, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to discipline him for that. And he shouldn't have done that. And, you know, he... No, God is not a keeper of our record of our wrongs. When he says, I forgive you, the word says that he takes our sin and throws it in the sea of forgetfulness and remembers it no more. He throws it as far as the east is from the west. It's gone. When he says, I forgive you, when you're forgiven by God, the reality is that he's taken it's gone. He doesn't remember it no more. That it is not because God has a bad memory. It's because he's washed it away. It's like it doesn't exist. I live in South Florida. Okay, it's a and it's a it's a and I'm not a beach person and I've never been a beach person. And I will probably never be a beach person. Okay, I, I you know I live in Florida. I'm not really fond of the beach. I don't like the sand. And, you know. Okay, so and besides which, I just don't like the beach that much. But if you ever walk down the ocean, and you look down, and you'll see footprints as you're walking. Now, if you walk down the ocean, you turn around and look, the waves will come in, and your footprints will disappear. And it's like you were never there. Your footprints are gone. Nobody can see them. There's not a print there. There's not a secret imprint in the sand that's hiding, and you just happen to don't see it. They're gone. The water has wiped you clean. It's wiped your footprints gone. And it's the same thing when God says he forgives you. When we are forgiven, God wipes away the footprint. He says he washes away the sin. Think about that. If we run around and say, okay, if God can't forgive me and i got to hold myself accountable, then all we're going to do is... We, it impacts our ability to walk in faith and believe that God hears us when we pray because if we think we're covered in sin and we can't be forgiven, we're constantly running around trying to figure out a way to be clean. We think we've got to earn our salvation and so we don't serve him because we're afraid to go before him. Listen to Psalm 103, verses 10 and 11. He has not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to his iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great, so great is his mercy and loving kindness toward those who reverently and worshipfully fear him. David wrote that God, even prior to Christ's blood, being shed for the remission of his sin, that God was a forgiving God. 
you know, a lot of people will run around and tell you the Old Testament is a book of anger and a book of, you know, it shows an angry and a mean God who's vindictive and just looking to catch people doing things. But this is not really, he's the same God. He didn't change when we got to the, you know, the period between the Old and New Testament. The Bible says, same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So he didn't change. Now, maybe our perceptions of him changed a little bit. And as he revealed more of himself, we began to learn who he really was. But the God in the Old Testament is the same God in the New Testament. A lot of people say, well, how can that be? I mean, look at what he did to Adam and Eve. He kicked him out of the garden just for eating fruit. Well, really? That was an act of mercy. Yeah, now, listen to me real carefully. And I know this is Jason a Rabbit, but you need to understand this part. Our God of mercy and grace and forgiveness is the same God who is in the Old Testament. He hasn't changed. Adam and Eve sinned, right? So in the garden, they ate the tree of, they ate the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They violated God's command, and they were deceived. Eve was deceived, and Adam actually sat there and listened to the whole conversation because the book of Genesis says that Eve... Eve took of the fruit and ate of it and gave it to her husband who was there with her. He he didn't wander off. He wasn't going shopping. He wasn't at the Garden of Eden Lowe's while Eve was being deceived by the Satan. She was, he was standing there right there. He should have opened his mouth, but he didn't. He let Eve do the talking. He was She was deceived. He willingly sinned. Okay? There's a big difference there. So don't ever let anybody tell you that women are the fault, that we, that we fell. It's not true. Adam was right there with them. If you, if you understand the Old Testament, you understand. Okay, but they sinned. Now, there was one other tree in the garden, which was the tree of life. It gave eternal life by um, partaking in the fruit. Think about your body as it is now. Think about the corruptible body you have. You get sick. You get hurt. My feet hurt. My feet swell. I have glasses, I eat too much, I'm overweight. All that is part of me. It's part of me here on this planet. At most, I'll live about 70 to 100 years, if I'm lucky. And I take good care of myself. And eat better than I do now. Do I really want to be in this body 10,000 years from now? The same defects and faults and problems? See, Adam and Eve sinned, and because they sinned, the only way to be redeemed was death. And so God had to kick them out of the garden so they wouldn't live forever in their sin. It was an act of mercy. The Old Testament is full of mercy if you look at it and realize what's going on. We didn't live in that culture, we don't necessarily understand it, but all of it shows us the same image of God, a God who loved, a God who forgave, a God who was working out a plan so that his son could come to this planet and die on the cross for us. Everything that happens in the Old Testament is simply a prelude. It is simply God working out the details so that Jesus came at the right time, at the right place, to save us. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. His very name means I am, I was, I will be. It's a, it's one of those weird words that we don't, and we really don't know the pronunciation, but, and I know as I'm chasing a rabbit, but I need you to be clear on the fact that the Old Testament God who was there in the Old Testament was just as forgiving and just as loving as the God we come to understand through his revelation through the New Testament. Okay? So, David wrote that God was providing a way forgiveness. He knew who God was. He knew his mercy. And and so he understood that where we were once filthy rags, he washed us in the blood of the Lamb and came out white as snow and perfect as new cloth. This is the God we serve. This is the God who says, I forgive you. I forgive you for whatever it is that you think you've done that's so horrible. I forgive you. Isaiah 118 says, Come, let us discuss this, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, what? They will be like wool. God reached out to his people and gave a promise that even though their sins were great and red like crimson, they would be washed away. 
Think about someone who removes stains from white clothing by adding bleach to the wash cycle. Got my mother absolutely loves bleach. She bleaches a lot. I've got some clothes that I've you know that didn't survive the bleaching process a couple times. This is over the course of years. This is not like it happens all the time, but it happens. And I've got some holy clothes that it got bleached when they shouldn't have been bleached. It happens, but bleach wipes away stain. I mean, that's that's the best thing I can think of to take away stain. Sometimes it takes away clothes, and sometimes it takes away you know, but it does take away the stain. Well, God wipes away our stain, much like bleach does. God bleached our sins to where they no longer exist. And those that we have repented from, they're gone. God says, you're gone. Cassie, you confessed, you repented, I've cleaned you. Don't come back to me five minutes later and say, well, God, you remember I did such and such. No, I don't. I don't remember it because you're clean. I washed it away. When I look at you, God says, I see my son. My son took your penalty. My son washed away your sin. My son cleansed you. And because you have asked for forgiveness, and because you have truly repented, and because you have sought that, and I gave you forgiveness, I cleaned you, your sin's gone. Now, please don't misunderstand this. I'm not telling you that if you go to God, let me pick something totally ridiculous. You go to God and say, look, God, I'm sorry. I painted the church pink last night. And I, I don't know that that's really a sin, but I painted the church pink. I go to God and I say, I'm sorry I painted the church pink. Church is pink. God says, it's all right. I know. I forgive you. I confess it. I repent it. I'm never going to paint it pink again. And God's forgiven it. It's wiped away. As far as he's concerned, the sin never happened. The church is still paying. The consequences of my action are still there. Am I held responsible for it in my sin? No. In the physical world? Yeah. If I go and rob a bank, and I realize later that this is a horrible thing to do, I violated God's law, I'm, I go to God, I'm truly sorry, I ask forgiveness, I repent of it, I confess, I repent, and then the police come and arrest me and they take me to prison. I'm still going to jail. I robbed the bank. There's consequences built into our actions in our natural world. But that doesn't mean that you've been, that God holds your sin against you. Okay? Yeah, there's built in consequences, and that's one of the reasons the best thing to do is to try to obey Him so that you can avoid those built in consequences. But our obedience comes because we love Him, not because we have to. It's not our duty. We're not doing things to earn God's love and favor. He loved us anyway. He sent his son to die for us while we were yet his enemies. So he doesn't need us to do stuff to be forgiven. He gives us stuff because he loves us. And we serve him and we obey him because we love him. Do you get the difference? I, I need you to be real clear on that. Because I don't want you running around saying, well, Pastor Mike says... That if I do something and I violate God's law and I go to him and confess and repent and he forgives me, it's gone and I don't have to suffer consequences for it. That's not really what I'm saying. You don't have to suffer the ultimate consequence. You're not going to hell for it. That part's true because Jesus paid the price for you. He's already died in your place. And he's washed away your sin and all you have to do is accept that free gift and you're done. You're forgiven. And so because of that, the other thing I need you to see is the flip side of this. You cannot run around and beat yourself up and say, Oh, I'm such a horrible, horrible person. You know, God forgave me, but I can't forgive myself. I'm going to beat myself up. I'm going to run around and hit myself with a stick. I'm going to do whatever it takes to punish myself for what I've done. Because I violated God's law. And God says he forgave me? That is the height of arrogance. That is like saying, God, you're not powerful enough to forgive me. I've done something so bad that even you can't forgive me for it. And even though you said you forgave me, I'm basically calling you a liar, God. I'm basically saying, you're not telling me the truth. You couldn't possibly have forgiven me. I've done something so, so bad and so, so horrible that even God can't forgive me. And so God is lying about forgiving me. 
exactly what you say when you say, I've done stuff that God can't forgive me for, and is exactly what you say with, when you say, I've gone to God, he's forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. You're saying God isn't powerful enough, and you are? That your opinion is more important than God? God bleached away our sins, and so they no longer exist in his economy. Those that we've repented from, and they've been washed away. It is like walking on that beach. It is like saying the footprints are gone. They've been wiped away. We confess our sins and repent. God wipes it away, and it is like those footprints. Our problem is that we continue to eat our, beat ourselves up over our sin. John, 1 John 1, 9 says this. If we confess our sins, ah, there it is, confess. Confess means agree with God about our sins. Admit what we did. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we confess and repent from sin, God cleanses us. Period. The problem really isn't that God won't forgive us. The problem is we won't forgive ourselves. We think we have the right to not forgive ourselves when God has forgiven us. And that's arrogance and that's pride. That's saying my opinion is more important than God's. And so when we run around and dwell and fester on our past sins and failures, even though they're forgiven, even though we've watched clean, even though we've confessed it, it's like we're watching a rerun of a really bad movie and we know what's going to happen and the outcome is always the same, but you just can't change the channel because you want to see if it changes each time you watch it. You cannot change the outcome of your past. Some Christians have this mentality in their minds that there are some sins they can't walk away from and they should not have to because they're doing what they're doing is normal and accepted in society. And that's the one other part of this. If you have unrepentant sin, you're carrying along with you. If you refuse to repent because, well, everybody else does it. Everybody else is doing this. Everybody else is doing that. And it's so normal and it's so natural nowadays. And even the Bible says it's a violation of God's law. And then it breaks his heart when I do that. It's okay because God just wink at it. Sin isn't that serious to some of us. Sin is like, okay, it's just something that God winks at. But he's not going to really send anybody to hell. Well, the Bible teaches differently. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Let's think about that. All sin. Not just one little sin, not, you know, not just the really bad ones, not the really, really horrible ones that everybody knows is bad, like murder and uh, lucking cats. No, I'm kidding. Um, sorry about that. I couldn't resist. But all sin, all sin is included in that statement. If... Spitting in the sink is a sin, and I'm not saying it is, so don't run around and say, I said that God said thou shalt not spit in the sink. But if spitting in the sink is a sin, and I do it, and I refuse to repent, and I've never accepted Jesus as my Savior and Lord, now there's a catch to all this, because then the wages of sin is $1.95? No. A really bad smacking on the hand and say, don't do that again? No. Something I can work out by doing a lot of good stuff to replace it? No. Wages of sin is death. Period. And the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And see, there's the difference there. I mean, we don't... Our sins earned us a one-way trip to hell. And if we get what we deserve, if God decided tomorrow to be fair, we'd all be in trouble. Because we fairly got what we deserved, we'd all be on our way to hell. But he chose to be merciful. And because he chose to be merciful, he chose to send his son to die for us. And so Jesus came to earth, he died on a cross, he rose again, and in washing away our sins, he took our place. He took our punishment for us. So what we need to understand is we're never going to move forward until we get out of this mentality that says, I've got to beat myself up, or I can keep sinning because... It's not that big a deal. Sin is just something God winks at. Sin is not a big deal. Well, yes, it is. All sin 
leads to death. Period. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life to Jesus Christ our Lord. And just because our society or our world or the people around us say, well, that's normal. Everybody does it. Everybody steals on their income taxes. Everybody cheats the grocery store. Everybody lies to their friends. Everybody lies to their teacher, to their boss, or to their wife, or to their kids. Everybody does it. If everybody's doing it, I'm going to be wrong. But God says it's sin, and you do it, then you've decided that sin isn't serious. So you've got two choices. You either recognize that when God forgives you, you're forgiven, period, clean. He doesn't hold grudges. He's not running around. There's not an accountant in heaven. God does not have an accounting department that sits up there and runs an out calculator every time you mess up. And when you go to him and say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned, he wipes it clean. At the same time, sin is serious, and unless you have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, then you're going to get what you deserve for your sin. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. God spoke to Jeremiah and told him this, No longer will each person teach his neighbors or his relatives by saying, Know the Lord, all of them, from the least important to the most important, will know me, declares the Lord, because I will forgive their wickedness and I will no longer hold their sins against them. The prophecy pertained to the new covenant, which we are all under. God said that under this covenant we will know him, and that he will forgive our iniquities to sacrifice in order to pay the price for their sin. In our case, however, we have a sacrifice already. His name was Jesus Christ. He died for us already. And so because he did all that, we are no longer dependent on the sacrifice of animals to represent what he was going to do. So Jesus already took care of all that. We don't have to do any of that. So the reality is that if he's forgiven us, he erases the act. At that point, it's up to each of us to move beyond the sins that we have committed and focus on our future the same principle applies to mistakes we've made in our lives. And, we're, and I'm not necessarily talking about things that God calls sin, but when we make mistakes, we need to move on. We need to get past it and let it go. If you cling to it and hang to it, it will end up destroying you. And so in order to walk in the fullness of what God has for us now, we need to learn to let go of those things that we think were so important in our past. We need to understand the regret is a place of no ambition, no joy, no peace, and not being able to see your blessings. It is a place of darkness and despair that God is trying to deliver us from. Man will hold us accountable for our past and try to influence us to live the rest of our life in regret. Isn't that what the world wants us to think? Well, I've done such and such, I've got to keep beating myself up. In our legal system, there is a term called double jeopardy. It means that once you've been acquitted on, of, or found innocent of a crime, you can't be retried in court for that same crime. That is our legal standard in which we operate, by, but by which we do not apply to God's forgiveness. Many of us live as if God is constantly retrying us for the sins in our past. Sins that have been washed away by the blood of Christ. We're no longer held for them. We're no longer accounted for them. As far as he's concerned, we wash clean. And we refuse to accept the fact that God has forgiven you and move on. The acceptance will enable us to begin to truly walk in faith without question. We will no longer have to wonder if God is truly hearing us or is he sitting there thinking, well, you know, I know they confessed this sin and I know that they did such and such a year ago, but you know what? I haven't let go of it. And I know they confessed it and I know I told them to forget of it. See, God's idea of forgiveness is so different and so radically different from ours that it takes us a little while to figure it out that what God is saying is, I don't hold you accountable for this. I've washed you clean. You're no longer, I've declared you innocent. Now, 
does that mean that there's not consequences? No, and I'm, I'm never saying that. And I'm not saying that. There are consequences. It's built into the world we live in. It's part of the natural law. But as far as he's concerned, you're washed clean. You can come into his presence. Yes, you're a sinner, but you're a forgiven one. You're a washed clean one. And because you're a washed clean one, you're no longer a slave to that sin. Because you've learned to be forgiven, because you've learned to, to accept God's forgiveness as washing away, you no longer have to be a slave to that sin. You know, Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Well, he's freeing you from the, from the need to be obedient to your sin. You're no longer a slave, folks. You're a bondservant in Jesus Christ. But you are, you are owned by him, but you are no longer a slave to sin. You are free to serve him. When the voices around us try to declare that we are unfit to serve God because of our past, remember it is God through Jesus Christ who justified each of us. He called us innocent. God has declared that we are qualified to serve and only God. When you believe this, you will begin to think differently about your situation when you get between the rock and the hard place. Romans 8, 31-39 records the following. When then... What then shall we say these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is interceding for us, who will separate us from the love of God, love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquered through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things above, or things below, or things in, pre things in present, or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Every tangled time, when we are between a rock and a hard place, it is our knowledge that God has restored us from when we failed him that gives us the confidence that he is with us. If you are running around thinking, God can't possibly forgive me for this, I'm not even going to ask. When it comes to the hard choices, when you've got to make a decision, when you come to that point where you're between two difficult choices and you need to make a choice that's in line with him, you don't really trust him because you don't think he's forgiven you. You think he's looking for a way to catch you. Somehow or another, we've gotten in our heads that God is sitting up in heaven with a giant sledgehammer waiting. Ah, I'm waiting for them to make a mistake so I can bop him on the head. But that is not God. That is not God in any picture in his word. And his word is his revelation of himself to us. If we know we're forgiven, we don't have to wonder what is going to happen when he promises he will rescue us and protect us. We don't have to be afraid when we're walking with God and believing and acting on what he says without compromise. Some of our decisions, without, although difficult in the flesh, will be clear when we have to act on them because we have repented, we are forgiven. Your footprints have been erased by the waves of God's love through the blood of Jesus Christ. We can walk a new path and as we go through this week, remember the fact that if you have repented from your sins, you are forgiven. You are restored to the relationship with God. And being between a rock and a hard place is not a problem that we make it out to be if we understand our Father. God loves you. And he made a way to forgive you. His Son paid a price for your sin. He gave his life. Jesus Christ is the only person to ever walk this planet to live a sinful life, sinless life.
Sorry. He's the only one who ever lived a sinless life. And because of that, because of what he did for us, and because he was innocent and he was pure, when he was crucified, he died for your sins and mine. When he was nailed to that cross, it wasn't because he was guilty of any wrongdoing. He never violated any law. He never violated any of God's law. And yet he died for us so that we could be restored. And it is the utmost in pride and arrogance to say, well, Jesus' death on the cross isn't enough to forgive me for what I did. Really? Jesus being nailed on a cross, dying in one of man's most inventive, miserable, torturous way created by humanity to die. All because of your sin. And it wasn't enough. It isn't enough to say Christ died for me, and so therefore I can be forgiven? Please tell me then, what thing that you've done that is so much worse that God can't forgive you through the death of his son, Jesus Christ, on that cross. If you're holding on to sin and you're saying, well, God can't forgive me of this because it's just so bad, it's so horrible that there's no way he can forgive me, then you're saying that Jesus is Christ. Jesus Christ died for nothing. that God isn't powerful enough to forgive you anything. You will not find that in the Bible. And I promise you'll never hear me teach it. But there is nothing in the Bible that says that any sin is beyond his ability to forgive you. The only thing that can't be forgiven is if you die rejecting his son, Jesus Christ, as your Savior and Lord. If you've never accepted him, if you've never repented, if you've never confessed that sin, then when you die, you'll pay the penalty for your sin. Period. Let's close in prayer. Father, as we bow in your presence, we recognize that we are so arrogant sometimes. We can be so evil because we decide that we have the right to think that you can't forgive us of that. Or that we're so bad that we've got to beat ourselves up even though you've already forgiven us. We know that we are simply sinners saved by grace and that you loved us so much that your son died for us. But we also know that you are a powerful and mighty and loving God who made a way for us when we didn't deserve the way, when we deserved punishment, when we deserved destruction, you chose to save us. You chose to send your son to die on a cross for us 2,000 years ago. And while we didn't deserve your mercy, we thank you for your forgiveness. I pray for those who are listening to my voice tonight, either on stream or in world, who don't know you, Father. They've fallen from you, and they don't worship you, and they don't know you, and they're on their way to hell. Father, I pray that you would bring them to see your Savior for what he really, really did. How he truly paid that price for you. Pray that Paid that price for us. That we don't have to pay the price for our sin because of what you did for us on that cross. I thank you that he rose again. I thank you that he's alive and we serve a risen Savior. We serve a living God. I can't take you, I can't take someone to the grave, Lord, and show them where your son was buried because it's not there. You're not in the ground. You didn't you didn't stay there. After three days you rose. And because you were alive, you paved the way for us to be restored to the relationship that God created us first for in the first place. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. In your most precious Son's name.
Amen. Now, there's some of you who've listened to my voice tonight, and your relationship with him is struggling. Because you're running around telling God, you can't forgive me of this. Please, it is time to let go of your past and allow God to wash it away. If you have truly sought forgiveness, if you have truly confessed your sin and repented, then you're done. God has cleaned you. Now, if you fall again, you'll have to confess again. That's the reality. But at this point, if you've gone to him and say, Father, I and I admit that I'm wrong, I admit what I did was wrong, and I want to turn away from it, I want to repent, then God says he's washed it clean. Some of you who listen to my voice tonight, you don't know him as Savior and Lord. You don't have that initial relationship to restore. And because you have rejected him and refused to realize what he's done for you, what you face right now is a fair God who will judge you for your sin. There is no such thing as earning points. There is no such thing as good and bad. There is either alive or dead in trespasses and sin. There is no other choices. If you have, ex have accepted Jesus Christ, you are really alive. You have been made alive. You are a new creature. But if you've rejected him, if you refuse to admit that Jesus is Lord, and you've con that you've gone to him and repented and turned your life over to him, then you're dead. You're just a zombie walking around for a, for a place to sit down. You just don't know it yet. Thank heavens we are forgiven. And his forgiveness means he's forgotten. And that's the, that's the hard part to do, Alex. You're right. To learn to change our thinking. If you've listened to my voice tonight and you don't know who he is, yes, you're right, Random. If you don't know who he is and you want to come talk, I'll be here. I'll be glad to sit down with you and talk to you about Jesus. I love talking about him anyway, so that's not a big deal. <laughs> If maybe you don't feel comfortable coming and talking to me. There's a website called thegoodnews.org. They have counselors on there who will be glad to stand, sit and talk with you and listen to what you have to say and answer your questions about what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. They also have a phone number, 1-888-JESUS-20. So if you don't of course, if you're listening to me in stream, I guess you're, you've are you got internet. I was going to say, if you don't have internet, you can call them on that phone. Um, but you do have that internet if you're listening to me at all. Um, if you just want to know more about our ministry, you want to get involved with Grace Baptist and what we do here in Second Life, you can check us out on our website at gracechurch-sl.org. And there's links there for our YouTube page, our um, prayer ministry, the table project, and um, as well as links to my email address and other ministries. So check it out. Um, we do have a YouTube channel. We post the sermons and all that. So please, you know, check it out. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget, we have morning devotionals at 3.15 a.m. SLT every day, Monday through Saturday, out there at the table. Feel free to join us anytime. May God bless and keep you. Thank you.